speaker today is um, <clears throat> Michael Grumis from the Workers International League. Uh, Michael has been involved in socialist politics since around 1996. Uh, he's been heavily involved in the anti-war and immigrant rights and also working in defense of the Cuban and Venezuelan uh, revolution for much of his adult life. Uh, he's currently helping to lead uh, a union organizing drive at a call center that he works at. And he also works with Utah Jobs for Justice and other broad co coalitions that help the cause for working people. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. Um, well, I was going to just go over, I guess it seems like the people who are here are kind of not Trotskyists, so I'm wondering maybe if I should just go over some really basic ideas here. Uh, I kind of was going to do that anyway, but um, as you probably know, there's a billion your Trotsky sects, so um, that's more where I was going and trying to maybe like link it with trade unions and things like that. Uh, but I guess I'll just start from the beginning, um, since it's you know, it's a, no, it doesn't seem like that's like the one maybe tendency here that's not really represented, <laughs> which is fine. Um, but I, you know, I guess from the beginning, Trotskyism. The whole idea, at least, from our perspective of Trotskyism, is that uh, we feel like the Russian Revolution, once it happened, um, you know, it, it was a, one of the most powerful, important events in human history, but at a certain point it began to degenerate. And actually, I would say probably early on uh, in the revolution, there was, a, there was a, begin the seeds of degeneration uh, because of the backwardness of the country. Um, you know, because there was no world revolution that was happening, uh, or the, the work, I should say the world revolution was happening, but it wasn't successful. Um, and that, you know, in our opinion, that was always the key to the Russian revolution. Any revolution is always that it's, uh, it's a world movement. It's not just one thing. It can't be isolated in just one country. In our view, that's what Lenin's view was. Um, so we feel like there was, a, at a certain point, because of this backwardness, uh, because there was uh, an inability to increase the productive level of the country beyond uh, capitalism, or even to a point that was, um, you know, at a certain point even under czarism, uh, that there was a backward, there was a backward uh, movement toward a bureaucratic degeneration, where the bureaucracy essentially became the, the leading class within the country, um, representing the working class in a kind of a, a, a weird, um, refracted way, um, but at the same time, you know, representing its own interests and having various factions that represent different classes within society, but ultimately representing themselves. Um, and because of that, Trotsky, in our view, was you know representative of the you know revolutionary section of the working class that was willing to continue on the fight of the revolution uh, to kind of bring it back to its original, um, you know. Theoretical underpinnings, its original orientation, its original, um, you know, its, its working class beginnings. Uh, and, uh, you know, essentially, when Trotsky was expelled in 1927, he actually initially had formed something called the Left Opposition. Um, and the, the Left Opposition essentially countered things from uh, other factions within the Russian Revolution um, that were in favor of either kind of staying where they were at as far as you know, working with whatever capitalist elements existed in the country because they had no choice, um, or you know, even going further and just, you know, like I think Bukharin had a similar slogan to uh, Deng Xiaoping, which was you know, get, something like get rich, go ahead, get rich, something like that. Um, so that you know, Trotsky, from the very beginning, his current, the left opposition, was speaking out against that uh, as a means to try and prevent uh, the dissolution of the country, you know, which he, which as Lenin had said, was uh, something that it was, uh, I guess, the Schmitschka, or however you pronounce that, uh, you know, the unity between the workers and the, and the peasants. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we feel that what happened was what Stalin actually represented was something very similar to what Napoleon represented for the capitalist class, which was essentially someone who did represent the interests of the capitalist class, uh, but in a refracted way. They actually did, you know, go against many of the capitalists, especially at the time, there were many capitalists who were willing to deal with whatever existed as far as feudalism because they were afraid of revolution. Uh, and 
in the sense that Napoleon kind of balanced, and other Bonapartists balanced between the classes, this is how we feel uh, Stalin, what he represented, what Stalin represented within the Soviet Union was a, a proletarian Bonapartist, is the phrase, is the term that we use. Um, kind of the, uh, a weird mirror reflection of fascism. Um, but it, on a completely different basis, a different, completely different property basis. Um, and because of that, having completely different uh, ramifications for working people. We obviously don't oppose, we, the Trotsky never opposed the Soviet Union uh, you know, in its property relations, but they opposed at a certain point, they, Trotsky and the left opposition decided that it was impossible to reform the government of the Soviet Union um, after lots and lots of you know, getting executed. Um, but actually, the, it wasn't even that. It was, there was a certain point, after Trotsky got expelled from Russia, he, you know, essentially what they wanted to, to be was to remain as uh, a, like a loyal opposition to the Communist Party. And it wasn't until the rise of Hitler that in, the, in, in Trotsky, and in, in my view, the inactivity of the Stalinists that were willing to uh, essentially let Hitler come to power without even a, a bullet being fired, um, that Trotsky and the left opposition decided to actually um, build something new, and that given the new world situation, which is, which is going to be something probably a lot similar to what we're in now, um, you know, it was going to allow for the emergence of a new international. Um, I don't believe that that ever actually happened. There, the fourth international kind of uh, was a, a bit um, aborted at birth, um, largely because the connections with the mass organizations that existed at the time was tenuous. Um, the uh, you know something coming out of a out of what in our opinion was a political counter revolution in the Soviet Union is not going to be as powerful as something that comes out of a revolution, obviously, uh, like the communist parties did. Um, and uh, because of these reasons and, and many others, especially what happened during World War II, the Fourth International that Trotsky set up, uh, it, it never really went anywhere. It never became a mass party the way the Third, Second, and First were. Um, and uh, actually, if, I, I believe that recently when Chavez was talking about with his idea of the Fifth International, he kind of uh, touched on this. And you know, while of course I disagree with many things that Chavez says, I think in this he's right. Um, that the Fourth International really, after, especially after World War II, splintered into a million different sects. Um, so I, here's a, with, with Trotsky, now it's a question of whether Trotskyists are just kind of, well, we're stuck in 1927 you know, or 1933 or something. Um, in reality, in our opinion, uh, Trotskyism is not about having some separate you know, ideological, oh, look, we love, we love Trotsky or something like that. The whole point is that we feel that the whole essence of revolutionary Marxism was essentially sucked out of the world, you know, socialist movement. The, the workers and peasants, in our opinion, the reason why socialism didn't go through the way that it should have, the socialist revolutions were failed in so many countries in the world, was precisely because of the middle class leadership that refused to take uh, very specific, uh, very specific orientation toward taking power in these countries, um, for various reasons. Uh, ties with, in our opinion, the Kremlin, or with uh, in China, um, and you know, worrying about foreign policy and trying to make deals with um, the imperialist countries to try and keep them off of the backs of their countries in exchange for uh, choking revolutions to death. Um, in, in our view, this is precisely the what caused the the um, disintegration of. Uh, Leninism, Marxism, Leninism, um, and which only exists, in our opinion, as it's kind of a some kind of an ideological core, um, you know, buried within manuscripts. Um, that we, I mean, essentially, what we're trying to do, and what we've been trying to do since that time, has been to um, bring out that that revolutionary core to Marxism that we feel was um, negated by. The, the actual leadership that emerged uh, over the years. Um, now, as far as the Fourth International splintering, I think it's, it's important to realize that after World War II, everything Trotsky said would happen uh, basically was completely wrong. He thought that fascists would be taking over, uh, there would be no more democracy, 
Um, you know, there's no way that America and Britain would be able to survive against the fascist machine. Um, that this, the social democracy and the communist international would, would completely disintegrate. Um, that, none of that happened. And in reality, because of what happened in the war, because the Nazis were defeated, you know, the fascists were defeated, and American imperialism and the Soviet Union came out of it, uh, the, essentially the victors of the world, um, that a new situation had arisen. Um, our tendency, our specific tendency, um, viewed what happened after World War II in a very different light from the rest of the Fourth International, and that what we viewed, uh, what was going on, was that there was a new capitalist upswing that was about to happen. Whereas the rest of the Fourth International saying, no, no, in five years it's all going to be over again, it's in the World War III. Um, basically what, we, what, uh, what we've been saying, what we were saying at the time, was essentially that uh, the destruction of World War II created a whole new capacity for capitalism to expand productively, um, and which I feel has borne up, been borne out by events. Uh, because of that, the way that we had to function would be very different from the way that we were functioning before, in that we would have to um, get involved with mass parties. Um, and there, there's many reasons for that. I think that uh, Part of the problem, and part of the reason there's so much splintering among the Trotskyist groups is because they're locked in a closet. There's no connection to the mass movement. Workers don't go to small groups. They go to large ones. You know, they go to their traditional mass organizations, no matter how horrible they are. They're going to immediately go to those first. Uh, it's a historical law. Um, they always go to their traditional mass organizations first. They might build other ones out of it. They might split those into pieces. Uh, but they're, they're not going to go uh, to, you know, a, um, a group of seven people. It's just not going to happen. They don't see them and they don't care about them because they don't feel like they can have any effect. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of times you have these little tiny groups and because there's no mass echo from, you know, working people who are involved, you get a lot of people who are talking to themselves and fighting over little things and end up splitting over them. Um, when if you have a, when you're involved in mass organizations, this is one of the advantages of being involved in them. You actually have an ability to um, actually actively, uh, you know, participate in the struggles of working people as they unfold. So um, I, I feel like that's a big part of, you know, one of the many, one of the many reasons that we get involved in mass organization. Uh, another one is that quite simply, there's no way a revolutionary party is going to be built out of nothing. You can't do it out of three people and a dog. You just can't. So, um, you know, given the nature of, of the whole world, given the nature of what actually came out of World War II, which was mass, the, the in our opinion, what we call Stalinists, uh, that took over most of the world, uh, on, well, I'm sorry, it should, took over like half of, what was it, a third of the world, something like that, and the imperialists that took over the rest. Um, this is a new world situation that we had to kind of deal with. Um, so. I mean, that's essentially how we function. We go within mass organizations, and we function as a cohesive Bolshevik center uh, within them, even the most reactionary. And in our opinion, this is what, uh, you know, Lenin, Trotsky, uh, you know, Marx and Engels, what they would have done. Uh, and not that that's like, well, that's what we should do because they said it, but that's how we feel the, the most effective way to really mobilize uh, working people and also to create a revolutionary party, that, that that's the only way to really do it. Um, let's see. So yeah, so while um, there's all kinds of separate organizations that have been created, um, you know, they, inevitably they end up kind of disintegrating on their own. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that, the, that this is the best strategy as far as uh, as far as Marxists in the 21st century, especially when everything there's many contradictory movements out there, uh, the PSUB in Venezuela, um, you know, the PPP in Pakistan, um, the FMLN, like they're very contradictory. They're not. They're certainly not traditional uh, labor parties. But the, the way to orient toward them is a real question. Um, I did want to kind of go into the United States and how we function here. Um, because this is kind of a unique situation. The United States of America does not have any mass organizations as far as political parties. What we have are 
two parties of the capitalist class. We don't recognize the Democrats as any kind of mass party uh, of working people or a party that's uh, even recognized as such. The, the Democrats essentially have, have functioned as an electoral machine um, for you know, the, the entirety of its existence um, and has actually played a genuinely counter-revolutionary role uh, in its past. So for those reasons, we actually fight specifically for a mass party of labor here. Um, which we, we would be willing to join. Of course, even we'd even be looking at other things. I personally think that there's there are many different possibilities. There's possibly a, a, like a, a mass populist party on the left could appear as well. I mean, these are all things that we can we as a tendency would consider as far as uh, entering. Um, at any rate, I think the only thing that we really can orient to concretely in this country, in the same way that we do in other countries. Um, is the unions. And we do that everywhere, of course, but we, there's especially important here where it's the only real um, you know, mass organization that exists. Um, but, but the way that we function with the unions, I would say, is probably pretty different from the way that other you know, Marxist or socialist groups function within them. Um, we actually don't hide who we are at all. When we, when we get involved in unions, the very first thing that we do is to try and build room, create room for radicals, create room for socialism. We try to create a base within the unions. And uh, while the bureaucrats tend to hate that, uh, it, it seems like working people, especially nowadays, where they, the kids barely remember Stalinism, and I know a lot of people here love Stalinism, uh, but they barely remember all the, I guess, the lies of their parents, I'm sure we all agree with that. Uh, they barely remember them, you know, they barely remember that even that stage in history um, where, you know, they hear socialism and they're not necessarily against it. Um, they may not know, you know, what the hell it is, you know, um, but, you know, at the same time, they can, uh, we can build that room, we can build a basis within the unions, and that's what we attempt to do. We work within um, sections of the unions that generally are like opposition tendencies. Uh, we work, but and we work at, in even opposition tendencies that are not that radical, we have opposition tendencies that are just kind of left of the, the current leadership. Uh, and of course, if we agree with the leadership, we're not just going to you know, oppose it because they're, um, because they're you know, in power or whatever. Uh, it's concrete. We, we take a look at every situation within the unions and we determine what do we feel, given the situation, given the forces that exist in the world today, or in the United States today, I should say, uh, what are we able to uh, actually accomplish with what forces we have, what forces the opposition tendencies within the union have, and what actually is going on in the union, who's actually in power, which group. Um, and so that's essentially what we do is we try and we don't openly attack the bureaucracy as just you know snakes and worms or whatever. We, we try and outflank them. We try and say, well, you know, why don't we do this instead? You know, we, we create practical alternatives for working people that they can actually say, well, yeah, I agree, we should be doing that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it, that's essentially our method. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's worked. It's worked in, uh, you know, within, the, within other countries it's worked. Uh, I've seen it myself during this union organizing drive. Uh, I would say union organizing is probably uh, quite a bit different. Union organizing is not like you have some open room to talk about whatever you want to talk about because you're under the complete dictatorship of the boss. But, um, you know, even still, you know, there's, there's a lot more room. You talk to people about uh, world politics, what's going on in the world, you know, how it relates, how socialism relates to their lives as workers. Um, and, uh, you know, these are the people that you're able to win over to, to socialism that way, they end up being the most militant unions. Um, they're the ones who are actually able to carry through things when other people are kind of wavered or worried about, you know, well, how much am I going to make? Uh, well, this guy can pay me more for, you know, this number of months. When they actually start thinking for themselves and becoming uh, actual, you know, revolutionaries, um, they actually can become the most powerful section of that specific, you know, union effort, whatever it happens to be. Um, so yeah, so I guess um, you know another thing is this. I kind of touched on it earlier. Was the uh, the fifth international that Hugo Chavez called? Um, we are definitely orienting toward it. Um, we feel that the the situation, what's going on in Latin America, 
in Cuba and Venezuela especially, uh, that these are essentially the, this is the, the, the leadership of the world revolution. Um, it's a very contradictory process. We are always open about our criticisms of Chavez and always open about our criticisms of anyone. Um, but at the same time, we support him when we agree with him. Um, and uh, you know, we feel like this Fifth International, because of the situation of the Venezuelan Revolution being at the vanguard of the World Revolution, can actually create a real international. You know, it has that potential. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to. There's a lot of parties that are getting involved. Actually, parties that we're involved in also already. Uh, that have all kinds of, again, contradictory leaderships. Um, you know, the FMLN, for example, has a very, you know, pro-capitalist section of it. Uh, and it also has one that's very, very, you know, pro-socialist. Um, so, you know, they're very enthusiastic. Part of them are very enthusiastic. Funes, the president, uh, is actually completely opposed and, can't, you know, hates Chavez. So the, the vice president is all for it. So it just shows the contradictions there. Um, but. At any rate, hopefully, I mean, we'll do our best to try and, and keep it from devolving into just a talking shop or just a grouping of bureaucrats um, that are just kind of coordinating their own bureaucratic efforts and really try and create a real new international. I think it's a real possibility. Um, and, you know, part of that uh, here again is part of the, the building the, the mass party of labor. And that's a, that's a real part, that's a huge part of what we're about, is building uh, a mass party of labor regardless of what the class content is. Uh, while we're for a mass party of labor that has socialist policies, we'll take anything that's mass, that's based on the unions, you know, that's based on the mass organizations of working people. Um, and we'll go from there. So, um, I, know, I guess it wasn't that long of a speech. I guess I'll just go ahead and leave it at that. Um, I'm sure I'll get marauded by everyone here, but... I don't know, do I stand up still, or...? Let's give him a hand first. Further than they've gone before, 
Um, and it's a lot of different factors that can cause that. Uh, change in the world situation, change in you know, the conditions here, um, the labor movement actually doing something just out of fear of not disappearing, you know, uh, entirely off the face of the earth. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's been rough in the past little bit, but uh, I'll talk more in detail about that later, about what the more specific things on it. Um, but, as far as our criticisms of Chavez, um, our view of Chavez is that he is a very genuine guy, and a guy who is a genuine revolutionary, and uh, who is, has taken the revolution uh, way farther on his own, just, uh, just himself. Uh, they, he kind of works, it, it seems like he kind of works uh, with the masses, the masses push him, and then he pushes the masses, and then the masses, masses push him. Um, and it kind of goes in that kind of weird elliptical shape. Um, but that ultimately the, the problem is that you know, what we need in Venezuela is a mass workers party that can actually lead, in our, in our opinion, can actually lead a revolution. And I think Chavez, the, the thing with Chavez is I think he initially started out with, a, I mean, if you, I don't know if people remember, but in 1998, he actually said he was a fan of uh, Tony Blair, you know. Uh, and nowadays, he's like creating the, the you know, social, United Socialist Party of Venezuela, you know, saying we're national, he's nationalizing banks, um, you know. Uh, it's a, quite, a, quite an evolution, you know. Um, but it seems to me that um, while he's done a lot of good things, he's still not, in our opinion, a Marxist. He still doesn't uh, understand that the, the need for uh, like Soviets to control the country. Um, a new power base, a new, it, it, you know, actually it's not entirely true, he kind of does. I mean, it seems like he's, he, every day he evolves further to the left. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, like, he's a very contradictory uh, figure. Um, we feel like his policies um, are also very dangerous though, because the fact that, uh, you know, Honduras just recently happened, we're worried that's going to happen in Venezuela too, you know. Um, and not just Venezuela, all throughout all Latin America, but Venezuela is, you know, the, it's viewed by the workers, uh, uh, working people of, of Latin America as a vanguard, so. Um, I guess our, our main criticism of Chavez is he's not determined enough, he doesn't want, it doesn't, it seems like he's doing it, but it's just so slow, uh, and that slowness is what can lead to uh, the generation of, of what's happened already, and, and even its overthrow. It actually has constantly. Uh, the, the coup plot, the oil strike, um, you know, it's, it's constantly, he's constantly getting like almost overthrown every time. And then the masses bring him back, you know, and then he gets more left. Um, so yeah, so I, I guess, you know, we're, we're in the PSUV right now in Venezuela and we work to make that into a Marxist party. Uh, we feel like it's a genuine possibility, it really could happen. And that there's no other place in the whole in in uh, Venezuela to be but the PSUV if you're a Marxist or if you're a revolutionary. Um, so as as a Trotskyist, if that's what you self-identify as politically, no offense intended. No. Most most Trotskyists, or at least the friends I have that are Trotskyists, don't necessarily view say something like collectivization as the real problem with Stalin, as Trotsky basically wanted collectivization as well. Um, it's mostly the problems with the purges. So I mean, I guess I would maybe ask you to narrow down what you specifically see the Soviet Union as the point at which they became a degenerate worker state, in your opinion, as a Trotskyist. Okay. Um, I mean, it's a everything. Obviously, as Marxists, we always view everything as a very complex, gray thing. Nothing is. Lenin said, "If you want a perfect revolution, you'll never live to see one." You know, and that's absolutely true. Uh, and uh, I don't think that there was any. There was a specific point when everything just suddenly changed, you know. I do think it was a slow process. I think even from the very beginning, even when war communism happened under Lenin, it was something that they didn't want to do, you know. Something that they were forced to do given the situation. And uh, that, it, including the NEP, like the NEP was definitely not something they wanted to do. And in fact, a lot of people at the time were predicting that was the end of the revolution. That, oh, now they're going to the capitalist road, you know. Um, but, <clears throat> We do feel that overall, like Leon Trotsky, I, I believe, I can't remember the name of the, it was a, a humanist. Um, humanism and terror, maybe? 
can't remember exactly. But one of them asked him, you know, what does terror have, uh, as far as revolutionary terror, how does that affect revolution? Does that lead to Stalinism, you know? And Trotsky said, well, kind of, you know, it can. It, it's the fact that there's a need for it, uh, and the fact that there's, uh, the, you know, generally the, if, if you're in a situation like that, that doesn't mean that this, the population is secure and under a government, you know? It's not secure under a revolution even. Um, and so the, the fact that that exists, you know, it, it leads, it can be part of the degeneration of the revolution. So I feel like there's, there was a steady decline, especially when the German Revolution uh, went down, you know, um, in 1919. There was, a, there was a degeneration that was creeping in, and, I, and I, we actually feel that Lenin himself was preparing uh, something against Stalin uh, to throw him out of office. Um, and that, you know, he wasn't able to do it. Obviously, just because he wanted to doesn't mean that it would have happened. It's a whole bunch of political processes. Lenin's wife actually said that if he was alive, I think in 1929, he, Lenin would be in prison. Um, but. The, uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a specific moment when it happened. We feel that at least by 1920 or 1932, with, when Hitler came to power, there was a real qualitative change that had happened at some point. Okay. Then this is a follow-up. So you mentioned this notion of proletarian bonapartism. Um, do you see Trotsky's writing, right, the former generals, uh, right, because you have the purges of the generals, mm -hmm. and this is mostly in response to Trotsky writing. Uh, from exile to overthrow Stalin and then take control of the Soviet Union. Um, do you view that as a positive thing or a negative thing? Yeah, I, oh, I forgot to address the purges. Um, I think some Trotskyists tend to view this as a purely democratic thing. Like, oh, we want democracy too, you know. Uh, in my opinion, genuine Trotskyists don't spend eight billion years, we don't want the fourth degree of democracy. It's not about Oh well, there wasn't enough democracy, so you know, burn them. You know, uh, it wasn't like that at all. In, in our opinion, the actually what Trotsky says, if you, if you read the Revolution of Betrayed, he says specifically, if the bureaucracy could lead to socialism, we would critically support it, regardless of how many people they execute. That's what he says, and I think that that's a very dialectical way of looking at it. it might seem kind of cold-blooded, but the whole point that he's trying to make is not that he likes executing people. The point he's trying to make is. The question is not about, well, how much democracy is there? How many people are being killed? How many, you know, abstract human ideas, human rights, or something like that. The question is, what will lead to socialism? And in Trotsky's view, and in my view, the bureaucracy, and I think we've seen in history, it show itself, that Stalinism doesn't lead to socialism. It leads to its opposite. Um, it leads to capitalist restoration at a certain point. Um, so that's, that's precisely what he was saying as far as, uh, in, in our view, what we are for is not just, you know, complaining about every little movement because they're not perfect, but about what policies are actually going to lead to socialism. I'll take it from anybody. I don't care if it's, you know, Ho Chi Minh or whatever. If it actually leads to socialism, but can it? You know, will it? And I would say, I would venture to say in this, in today's world, uh, where there is no Soviet Union for, you know, governments to balance on, or for some middle class movement to take over the, the, the workers movement, I would say it's impossible without a revolutionary socialist party. Um, two questions, or I, I guess one qualification. Um, you mentioned that Lenin was possibly looking to remove Stalin, but also wasn't Lenin extraordinarily critical of not just Stalin, but also uh, Kamabev, also Zinovev, and also Trotsky. Um, and I mean, isn't it, isn't it the case, even in, in your view, that Lenin was historically very distrustful of Trotsky, especially because Trotsky joined the Bolsheviks extraordinarily late in the revolutionary game, as it were. Um, so one is, isn't it essentially the case that Stalin wanted to n not throw out, but remove the power from most of the, the inner herd, the so-called old Bolsheviks, especially with Lenin's testament, which called for the expansion of the Central Committee. And so you would agree with that? Um, or do you think that's a distortion? Um, well, no, I do think that he was incredibly cri uh, critical uh, of uh, various factions. Throughout the whole history of, you know, before the revolution, during the Soviet government, uh, and toward the end of his life, there was a lot of, um, Alliances made, changes in positions. I think that initially Leon Trotsky 
um, was there was, a, there was a rift between Lenin and Trotsky because of the, I don't know, I don't know if this is, it seems like this is a pretty educated crowd. <laughs> I don't know if it's too esoteric. Uh, but like the old, you know, 19, what was it, 1902 Congress where there's a split between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, uh, Leon Trotsky kind of had a vacillating position between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. He wanted them to unite. Um, and uh, there was more, more of that actually did begin to happen in 1905, uh, after the 1905 revolution, but then, you know, went complete opposite after that. Um, with, the, with the ebb of the revolutionary movement in 1906. Um, and then he came back uh, in 1917 uh, with his own group, and then eventually they ended up fusing. Um, I mean, these are all kind of his... I think it's important to bring it up because of how it relates to today. So I don't want people to think this is just some kind of like, a, a, you know, well, okay. Now that's a really interesting history lesson, but what are we doing now? Um, but I think it really reflects the differences in, you know, what the different factions represented. I, I believe that each faction within the government represented at a certain moment, uh, to some degree, you know, the working class or sections of the middle class, uh, or a section or other groups, that in, in, I believe that Stalin, for example, represented, uh, like I said, something that tried to balance between all of them, but ultimately represented the ruling group. Um, I feel like there was a period where Lenin, uh, and Trotsky were kind of disagreeing. Uh, while during this, not just like during the revolution, I believe Lenin and Trotsky really uh, came together. Uh, there, that was the moment where they agreed, you know. Um, and uh, you know, Lenin said there was no better Bolshevik than Leon Trotsky, you know, when he came back. Um, and uh, you know, the, during that whole period, I, when the April thesis happened, when they were talking about reorienting the party toward actually taking power instead of just making deals with you know Mensheviks. Uh, even letting them into their like party congresses and stuff when they're running this capitalist government. Um, that at the time, um, you know, there, there was a very close unity between them. There was a period, I think, in 1920 when there was a, a bit of a rupture and different factions, uh, you know, didn't know what to do with the the situation in Russia. They were, essentially they were isolated, you know, a lot like Cuba is today. Uh, the, the revolutions in Eastern Europe or in Western Europe didn't happen. Or they did happen, and they went down to failure. Um, and uh, there was different factions that were saying, "Well, we need to go to war, you know, revolutionary war now." There were sections that, say, that were saying, "We need to, you know, wait and see what happens." There were ones that were saying we need to do a, a treaty. You know, um, the treaty one eventually won out because the Germans were actually about to take over, you know, the whole whole swath of Russia anyway. Um, but. I do believe that ultimately that the same political, while he did have some criticism of Le, criticisms of Leon Trotsky, in general, uh, they were pretty much in sync, that their political views were uh, very much in line, and that actually Stalin was kind of a secondary figure um, up until, uh, you know, later on when, in my opinion, in our opinion, uh, the, the bureaucracy that was taking power felt he was a playing tool for them. Um, May I follow up? Yeah, yeah. But I, so perhaps I should I should lay lay down what's at stake for me in this discussion, which is often uh, Stalin is characterized as this leader. I mean, this even proletarian form of partisan. But I think what's important to know is that for any society, um, that there that the leader is obviously important, right? Stalin made decisions. Um, Mao made decisions. Chavez makes decisions. Barack Obama makes decisions. But they do so within an entire collective. Um, and so, right, what I would say is Stalin was not in sync with Lenin to the exact same, or pretty close to the same extent, that Trotsky was not in sync with Lenin. Um, and the way in which I would characterize this would be, for example, the huge split over the NEP, the fact that Lenin condemned both Trotsky and Stalin. But in addition, right, I mean, these are lesser known figures because uh, no one no one that I know, at least today, is a Xenobedist. Um, but uh, but the, 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 that is a matter of fact, it, there was, there, both for Trotsky, right, it, it's important that it's not just the Trotsky wing and the Stalin wing, right, it's the left opposition, which includes a whole host of other figures which don't agree. But also, um, it, it's, I, I, I completely disagree with the narrative of, you know, it, had Lenin survived, he would have passed it on to Trotsky, 
Or, I, I think this is also false, that had he survived, he would have passed it on to Stalin. I don't think he would have passed it on to either of them. And I think this is also immense, or the, the Trotsky story is further undercut by, for example, Lenin's wife's reaction to Trotsky's The Lessons of October. Yes, she was more sympathetic to Stalin, or uh, I'm sorry, for he slept. She was more sympathetic to Trotsky, you know, after the death of Lenin. Mm -hmm. But in the 30s, right, she was, she ultimately sided with Stalin against Trotsky, specifically because of the lessons of October. Um, I mean, wh what would you speak to that? Do you think that that is a fair characterization? Is that in contradistinction to what you view yourself as saying? Um, well, see, I actually think that during that period, well, there's, like I said, there's a lot of different periods in the, in the Russian Revolution. But during the period before, when Lenin, before Lenin came back. Now, you know, let me, let me qualify this before I say anything else. Uh, as far as personalities, obviously personalities always end up made, no matter what, whether you want them to or not, end up playing a role in revolution. Uh, it's just a fact. It always has been. It's not necessarily a good thing, uh, but it's always going to be there. Um, and I think a lot of times uh, the mass people end up taking a personality and saying, well, this is, you know, represents me. You know, this is who this is who I'm for. You know, I'm Trotskyist. I'm Stalinist. You know, but I wanted to make a point that while that's true, the the real question isn't about well, does Trotsky and Stalin fighting or whatever. But the question is, what do they actually represent? And, and in my view, these different personalities that end up looking like personalities uh, actually represent specific classes uh, or or mixtures of classes or, you know, so I just wanted to make that point first of all, just so it's not, it doesn't seem like some esoteric historical question, you know, um, especially considering the fact that the downfall of the, of the Russian Revolution, I think, uh, you know, is such a profound, you know, effect on the world uh, situation. Uh, the downfall of Russia, even in 1990, you know, a huge uh, repercussions that are all, pretty much all negative, um, in my view. Um, now, as far as Lenin and Trotsky, I don't believe that Stalin had much of a political position on much of anything until he actually started becoming the spokesman for the bureaucracy. He initially, before the revolution had happened, he was one of the ones who was instigating um, the, uh, this alliance with the Mensheviks and the provisional government uh, with the Bolsheviks or through the Mensheviks. Um, but it, you know, the, the whole thing, the, the different uh, political positions, he's not someone who, who had a whole lot of positions, in our view. Uh, he was kind of, uh, he, he, was a, he was a good propagandist at times, but in general he, wasn't, he was not a theoretician. And there's not a whole lot of theoretical works you're going to find from Stalin in general, or at least that were genuinely written by him. Um, it, Stalin was, in fact, didn't disagree with Trotsky on anything as far as a world revolution, how we can't have socialism in one country, until, in, in our view, until the bureaucracy needed some kind of tool within uh, their own ranks that was going to represent their interests, their new conservatism. Um, which reflected this new bureaucracy, reflected the tiredness of workers who didn't want to do anything else, who were, as Lenin said, declassed because of the war, uh, were, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the middle class layers that only had interest in their, per in their perks and privileges. Um, and for that reason, all of a sudden the theory started to change. Um, and the uh, world revolution wasn't what was on the map anymore, it was about self defense at all costs. Um, so that's, in our view, this is completely opposite of what Lenin was for. Um, and in that sense, Lenin, and, and so it doesn't matter who, oh, he would have, you know, endowed Trotsky with the crown of communism. The real question is, who was representing the policies of Lenin? You know, who was representing, and not just of Lenin, but of the revolutionary working class, you know, uh, worldwide and in Russia. And in our view, that was uh, Lenin, and, uh, you know, after, the, after Lenin and during, for much of the time, uh, Leon Trotsky. Um, so that, that's the real question in our view. Um, so, yeah, at a certain point, Stalin started to get all kinds of interesting theoretical ideas uh, out there, but in general, they were just kind of pragmatic. Well, we need to exist now, so what do we do to exist? Well, uh, you know, I, I talked a very little bit on the phone. We talked about, um, you know, a lot of the zigzags of the, of the Soviet bureaucracy, which, um, in my view, had nothing to do with revolution. They had to do maybe with self-defense, 
uh, of the nation, but it certainly wasn't uh, the internationalism of Che. It certainly wasn't the internationalism uh, of Lenin. Uh, in, in my view, you know, the deal with Stalin and, and Hitler was, in, in my view, was one of the biggest crimes in, in Stalin history. Um, and uh, you know, working with the, the imperialists almost a year, uh, what was it, two years later, the, the, the American Communist Party has a completely opposite view. You know, against the war, uh, turning to against the the war against the people or something, with uh, siding with the United States. Uh, you know, Roosevelt went from a went from a fascist to a progressive bourgeoisie in like two uh, two years, I think. Um, and, and my view, this has nothing to do with, with socialism. This has to do with uh, the interests, the foreign policy interests of a conservative bureaucratic clique in Russia. Um, much like in a union, where you'll find in every union, basically, uh, especially in this country where there's very little within the unions, uh, that uh, it's, it's a bureaucracy, it's, it's a self-serving bureaucracy. But I do feel like um, there's a lot of possibilities, even within a bureaucracy, within a bureaucratic worker state. Um, the, Far, you know, if you look at Cambodia now, you know, good lord, it's it's awful. But what the what the imperialists have done to that country, um, say what you want about, you know. Well, I guess you could say a lot about <laughs> some of the people that led that uh, in Seri. But if you're talking about even the, the Vietnamese when they controlled Cambodia and led it like a Soviet government, I mean that was, I mean as horrible as that was, I mean look at what it is now, you know, so. All right, so uh, my question is, uh, so you guys support uh, unions, basically, um, within, as long as they're moving towards a socialist, they have a socialist agenda, or at least you try to push a socialist agenda. Um, would it be beneficial to actually try for uh, some type of syndicalism, where the actual workers own the factories, rather than having bosses to actually report to and have to work with a different bureaucracy. Um, yeah, that's the thing. I wanted to qualify that. I actually don't, honestly, I don't think unions should be socialist, especially at this stage. Uh, I think, in general, unions need to be what they are. I mean, the unions are, are very, they're, they have a limitation. There's a lot of limitations, I should say, to what they are. They're not a political party, in our view. They can't represent, uh, you know, like a, a, they can't be like a, a political movement uh, in and of themselves. They, they represent the united front of workers of every political persuasion uh, fighting for uh, their, their rights as the producers of wealth. Um, it, it's uh, the, the exact mirror reflection of you know, the monopolies and the syndi uh, syndicates and whatever uh, that the capitalists have. So we don't, we're not in favor of turning these unions into socialist unions. What we are in favor of, though, is, uh, at least at this stage, certainly at this stage, at this stage what we want is to build, get as many workers into these unions, reorganize, build the unions up to, you know, what they were in the 50s, build them up to way more, you know. Get every, you know, damn worker in the country unionized, you know, if possible. Um, regardless of what they're, even if they're, you know, teabaggers, I don't care. Get in the union, you know. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's what they are. They're, they're a united front. We build it as a united front. But, but at the same time, as we build those united fronts, we also maintain our own specific uh, tendency, our own specific Marxist core. And when we're talking to workers, we always say, we always feel like uh, explaining, like bringing socialism to the, the workplace, bring it to the, the union, is the best way to make it strong, you know, the, the way to make it stronger. So. Uh, but that, again, what we want right now is not just to make it into a, a socialist union. In fact, we're very, we feel like at this stage it would alienate uh, workers from unions um, because they don't know what it is and that they can't do it if they don't know what it is, you know. But once, while we're in the unions, that's what, we're, that's what we do. We try to maintain that cohesive Bolshevik center and explain it to them patiently, the way Lenin said. Um, what is socialism? What are we for? What do we represent? You know, this is our tendency. This is what we we represent. We're also a part of this left opposition current. You know, um, we think that you should be part of that. You know, basically taking workers where they're at and maybe going a little bit further. You know, so that's that's how we function in unions. That's why this is what why we're so in favor of 
a Labour Party, why it's so important to get something that represents our interests, something that we can, uh, you know, but what happens? We go on strike uh, and we get militant and we occupy a factory. Maybe it doesn't go as well as UE. Maybe some, you know, here in Utah, some Republican says, okay, well, let's bring in the SWAT team, you know. Um, who knows? It's a Democrat could do it too, you know. Um, so, you know, what do we need is a party that actually represents the union. So what happens then? Is someone going to actually go against the union that brought them to power? Maybe, but it's going to be a hell of a contradiction. They're going to have to deal with that when they, you know, run for election again, you know. Uh, their real constituency is working people. Um, so that's why we think while, while the trade unions can represent a very uh, elementary level of working class organization on the economic front, the Labor Party is so fundamental on the political. You know, it, it unties that one hand from the from the back of of the of the boxer. I guess I don't know. I don't know where that was going. Yeah, just an observation I'd like you to comment on. It seemed to me like one of the huge criticisms you have of Stalin is the fact that. He's a party member, and he's disconnected from the working class. How is it that what you've just proposed about having a labor party and then having non-political unions not going to immediately create that contradiction? I think a labor party on a non-socialist basis will be riveted with contradictions. It'll be uh, probably, you know, I mean, look at the labor party in Britain. Good Lord, you know. Uh, people will call us imperialists because we participate in the labor union in England um, because of their horrible policies in, in Iraq and whatever, it, which is really just the Blair clique uh, on top, uh, and other sections of it that, that have supported Blair in the past, um, which we completely oppose, 100% uh, within the Labor Party. Um, but no, I don't actually, I don't think that, I think there's a lot of uh, things that will happen that are probably not good with just a non-socialist labor party that appears. Um, but it's an elementary step. It's the beginning. I don't think that workers are going to be able, in their present state, where, where they're at right now, are going to be able to move towards socialism without some kind of vehicle that represents their interests, uh, even in a distorted way. Um, I do think that, uh, I mean, here's the thing too, I wanted to mention as far as Stalin and Stalinism and the worker states, we do call them, that's true, deformed worker states, proletarian Bonaparte states, whatever. But it doesn't mean we don't think like the Chinese Revolution was one of the greatest uh, events in human history. We do. We actually, could, you know, Trotsky is our tendency, at least, views the Chinese Revolution as probably the second greatest, um, you know, the second greatest uh, achievement in human history next to the Russian Revolution. You know, despite all of the distortions and deformities uh, of its leadership and what eventually ended up happening in the country. Um, so I don't want to get across this idea. We're not like, there's a, probably plenty of Trotsky's groups that are like, well, uh, Stalin and Hitler are the same, and you know, maybe the U.S. is even better, or maybe the U.S. is the same as Stalin, or you know, whatever. We're not like that at all. Our, our view, and it's the same view as Trotsky's, is that a worker state under any conditions is better than a capitalist one. Um, so I did, I did want to give, I did want to, to, to point that out. Given that the nature and what you're saying as far as like the Labor Party would create a new bureaucracy, uh, I'm trying to get these people into, well, I don't want to say the name of the union. We're trying to get them into a mainstream union here in Utah. And it's pro got probably the worst bureaucracy uh, you can imagine in the state. Um, but nevertheless, we're trying to do it because it's an, it's an elementary stage, you know, to moving beyond that. If we had the forces, if we had the ability to create the kind of uh, unions that workers need, and not just the kind of unions, but the kind of revolutionary party that workers needed, uh, it would be completely, we'd be totally opposed to it. We wouldn't be for bringing them into that specific union. You know, We would be into, uh, we would see, as far as we could take it, we would take it. You know, uh, But given the current state of the working class in this country, there's no other choice. We, we don't have, in, in our view, we have no other road but to view it as a united front, bring them into the mass organizations as they exist, and try to move those mass organizations as far to the left as we can, you know. I apologize, I don't like the works of Lenin, I'd like to reference some specific passages. But I mean, at this point of just getting them in the union, qua union sake, right, this sort of notion of trade union struggles, um, do you think there's a point in which these become a vehicle for raising class consciousness, as well as taking like the sort of workers that organize their own places and bringing them into a party organization proper to disseminate more revolution? Um, I mean, Lenin, there's, there's a couple lines, right? He says, 
one specifically, we're not like I'm. We're not trade union secretaries. We're a tribunal of people. But also, there's a passage where he says he's, he's quoting somebody and he's saying, "Okay, how is it such that we determine the tasks? Right? What is? How should we interpret that statement? Is it the case that they sort of just tell us what to do? When we go there, we you know, sort of observe what their conditions are. Uh, and it's almost a sort of notion of the mass line, right? From the masses to the masses, where the masses are, sort of, hey, we have these problems. Uh, as the vanguard, you come up with the solutions and then lead them into those solutions. So do you see, do you see that is what you're doing with this sort of union struggles, or do you think it's just trade union struggles? No, that's oh, good, something very specific I wanted to bring up. We have a lot of differences with a lot of Trotskyist groups, because a lot of them, in our view, do do precisely what you're saying Lenin said not to do, which is become trade unionists, just trade unionists. You know, they become trade unionists that happen to be socialists, or are secretly socialist, or are, you know, well, I mean, the reality is that you can be, you can call yourself a socialist all you want. I think John Sweeney was a member of the Democratic Socialists or something. Uh, one of, the, you know, definitely not a supporter of John Sweeney um, and uh, the, the previous AFL-CIO president uh, before Trumpka, uh, who's the, the current one. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the thing. We're we're not. That's one very big distinction. In fact, there's been a lot of. Uh, a lot of issues with people that have left our organization over them. Um, because we precisely, when we deal with the mass organizations of unions, uh, of the working class and unions, we, we're not just there to, you know, be great union secretaries or whatever. We, have, we judge based on the situation, what can we achieve, you know, how can this advance socialism, and how much of a base among my coworkers do I actually have, you know? Am I creating, is this just some part of, you know, am I just uh, doing? Am I just at a union meeting and some union boss is like, "Oh, here's an active guy. Let's get him in there." You know, um, you know that's very possible. The reality is that's going to lead, regardless of what you say of who you are or what your political orientation is, down the road of doing what the bureaucrats want you to do. Uh, we feel that it's very strong, very strongly about the fact that, and this is why we function differently. When we run for union positions, we do it for specific reasons. We attempt to. Uh, build socialism with it. We try to bring people into the movement, into the, into the IMT and into the broader labor movement, you know. Uh, and we, uh, you know, we have specific goals in mind. You know, we never try and just overload one comrade with all the union work, because that's another way people get, you know, totally burnt out and leave. Uh, the key thing is that we, uh, we always have to have a, a firm grasp on what, our, what we're doing and what our base is, you know. What are we actually accomplishing? What are we trying to do? Um, so it, that's one thing. We're never, we never run for union posts out of the blue just because, you know, whatever. It may as well get in the union, you know, ever. Uh, we're, we are precisely what I would say. We're not trade unionists. We're socialists, you know. Um, you, you mentioned something really interesting, um, which is to say, uh, you know, the most important thing is that we we have a successful revolution. Um, so, of course, right. The question, at least, I've heard some Trotskyists argue this, and depending on how you read the lessons of October, perhaps Trotsky argued this, um, that ex the Russian Revolution was a, a, a revolution led by Marxist ideology with a strong influence of Lenin that would later become Leninist ideology. Um, and then later, I mean, I, I don't, obviously you call him Stalinist, but I, I think that Stalin just viewed himself as a Marxist. Uh, he wasn't a theoretician. He was pragmatic and practical, and he viewed himself as just applying the principles of Marxist-Leninism to the, the Soviet Union, the material conditions of the Soviet Union. Um, the same thing with Mao, right? Initially, I mean, he would later do theoretical work, but initially he just saw himself as a Marxist-Leninist. With that said, right, the Maoist ideology has led to world revolutions. The Marxist-Leninist ideology, with a strong Stalinist bent, has led to world revolutions. Where you see either a Trotskyist revolution, if you don't see a Trotskyist revolution, why has there not been a Trotskyist revolution? And if there aren't significant, or if there aren't, isn't a significant defense why there hasn't been a Trotskyist revolution, why should we uphold the theoretical positions of Trotsky? No, that's a really good question. I think it's the number one problem <laughs> with my movement. Uh, it's, it's easy to say, well, well there's results. Well, we go where there's results. And in fact, I think that's what working people do. 
uh, in general. They say, well, where are the results? Who can get results? You know, I, I would say working people probably around the world are pretty pragmatic in that respect. Um, and actually, it's true. Um, there, Stalinists have been the, well, I wouldn't say just, like, as far as Stalinists, but just uh, uh, communist parties led by Stalin, or led by people that I would refer to as Stalinists. I know there's a lot of different ideas of what Stalinist means uh, everywhere, not just in this room. Um, but, you know, the, these, even those, I would say that even those have not been the only ones that have led revolutions. Uh, and this is another thing where we have a, a bit of a difference with some other tendencies. There are other countries that we feel had, a, you know, even revolutions that completely overthrew capitalism, overturned all, prop, all capitalist property relations, uh, and established a worker state that were not, you know, communist parties. Um, for example, in Ethiopia, um, for example, in Burma, uh, which was led by really one of the most brutal, you know, uh, regimes in history, but it was still, you know, they overthrew, overthrew capitalism for whatever, you know, however horrible it was. Uh, it, they, they still did it. They still overthrew it. Uh, and they, they were not Stalinists. However, it is true. Given the situation that happened after World War II, and that's, I think, the key, uh, I don't think if you could look at the world before World War II and think that Stalinists were the only revolutionary tendency. If anything, they were, you know, there's, uh, if you look at the Spanish Civil War, there's a billion, I'm sure there's a billion interpretations in this room about the Spanish Civil War, um, but in our view, the Stalinists drowned it in blood, and they were one of the ones who mainly drowned it in blood. And not just Trotskyists, but other, pretty much every tendency, they even led it to the right of, uh, of a more, of a, of a capitalist government, where it was at. Um, I would say that for every revolution, the Stalinists led in a backward country, and when I say backward, I don't mean that pejoratively, but in a productive way, uh, like a country that's not as developed. For every country they led uh, a revolution in a backward country, they drowned fighting blood. And I think that's the key issue here is they're, they're fine, they were fine with leading revolutions, or not even leading, but passively accepting many times, or not overtly overthrowing revolutions, in countries they knew they could control because they were so poor. Um, but in advanced capitalist countries, it was country after country that they, they dec in, in, in our view, decimated the revolutionary movement, uh, and uh, led to a counter-revolution. Um, particularly in Western Europe, where it was the most important, mainly as, again, foreign policy, uh, fears of the, you know, their own perks and privileges, fears of you know, pissing off the imperialists in these countries, fears of, a, in our opinion, a genuine socialist revolution throwing them out. Um, so, that, I mean, so I guess my view is that while it's true Trotskyists have never led uh, a revolution, it, it's because of this, the bizarre world situation that emerged after World War II with these two main powers existing side by side in, because of nu you know, nuclear weapons, uh, a whole host of reasons. Uh, you know, the mass is looking to the Stalinists uh, because they were able to survive World War II. Um, you know, that they're taking over of Eastern Europe. Um, you know, a whole host of reasons because of that, which ultimately ended up being a big, you know, empty flan um, that ended up just deflating because with lack of support. Um, I would say that's why I'm a Trotskyist. Um, it seems it seems as though I would have two objections. Uh, I mean, one is perhaps overly pedantic, um, but one uh, one I would say is then I I think it would be there, there's two arguments I think against your position. Um, one is pr uh, practical and historical, and the other is theoretical. One is I I would. You obviously don't have to do it now on the spot, but I would actually encourage you to to name right the five the five revolutions for each one. You know that that the Soviet Union was successful. I mean, you've got all every single country in Eastern Europe. You've got Vietnam. You know, North Korea, Cuba, North uh, Vietnam. Uh, yeah, North Vietnam, which later becomes Vietnam. Um, I mean, that's that's a that's a pretty good track record, and and. And nuclear weapons, see, unlike, unlike a lot of the Western capitalists, the Soviet Union wasn't religious. And I don't mean this in any pejorative sort of way, but a religious belief can often encourage you to do things 
that from a geopolitical scheme are not rational in a strict political sense. For example, the Soviet Union was deeply concerned about being obliterated by nuclear weapons, whereas given the historical record we have, it's not so clear that John F. Kennedy was. Um, and so, I mean, given that, it seems that, as a matter of fact, the, the Soviets did a very good job of creating and securing revolutions, or the, the quote-unquote Stalinists. So that's the historical point um, which you can address. And then the theoretical point is this. Isn't this at least slightly hypocritical for a Trotskyist to say, given that, and, and to be fair, I don't, I'm not criticizing Trotsky for what I'm about to say, <laughs> um, but isn't there an argument that Trotsky drowned in rivers of blood the anarchist, Maknavist revolution in Ukraine, and also the workers' uprising in the Kronstadt? It seems, which I do, I do accept the logic of Trotsky at that time, which is, even if it's a popular movement, if it objectively threatens the revolution, it should be crushed um, as peaceably as it can. I mean, most of the Kronstadt um, sailors were given amnesty, uh, but still it needs to be stopped. Doesn't that then become hypocritical when, when one of the main criticisms of Stalin is, rather than having worker power, you have crushed the world revolution? So that practical and theoretical criticism, how would you respond to that? Um, as far as the, uh, the world revolution is concerned, I think these are different things, in my opinion. Um, the, uh, I, I, honestly, I think that the drowning of blood in, of Kronstadt, uh, I think that this is something that they resorted to as a last measure. They had no choice. You know, there are a lot of things that were going on in the country just surviving. As a republic, they came uh, within a, you know, a a millimeter of losing everything, um, and uh, I think that was the the reason why that happened, why the why Kronstadt was put down. Um, I'm sure there's Jared, there's all kinds of uh, arguments against what they did. It's you know obviously you know looking back nowadays it's different. Um, it's it's easier to to make overall criticisms. Um, I think in general they probably were forced to just like they were forced to do Brest Litovsk. Uh, which was the treaty that gave all this land to the, you know, the Germans, um, and uh, you know, the German monarchy, and, which is a, a horrible thing to have to do. But I think that they were probably forced to, given the situation. Um, however, I don't. It's for me. It's not a question. Again, it's not a question of drowning in blood, as horrible as that is. And I and I also think that there's a a question as to what that actually means. It depends on where, uh, and when, and what exactly. When you say drowning in blood. Um, now, when I'm saying world revolution, I'm talking about world revolution, revolutions in countries that did not, were not achieved precisely because the Stalinists were literally murdering the revolutionaries. Because of that, the revolutions in these countries were not achieved. Capitalism was maintained. This is a different situation than the Soviet Union. Say what you want about Kronstadt, they maintain workers, uh, workers, a worker state there, workers' property relations, whatever your criticisms of the Bolsheviks. You know, they did not overthrow property relations, they were the biggest defenders of it. This is very, in, in my opinion, completely opposite of what was happening in other countries where they were prevented from doing that. Um, the Stalinists literally prevented the revolutions from taking place. Um, and uh, Quick interjection, could you name one of the countries that you were referring to? Uh, sure, Germany, France, Italy. Yeah, uh, the, the German uh, well, I mean, there's initially several revolutions in Germany. Uh, the, in 1923, it was still kind of uh, up in the air what was going on in Russia. Um, but the, the leadership was had decisively moved in, in our in, in our opinion, had moved more toward the bureaucracy at that point. Uh, there was, uh, you know, the German obviously the German Revolution in 1932 that ended up with Hitler taking power. Um, there was. Uh, in, in France in the 1930s, the same time period, 1934, uh, in Spain, um, in you know, 1931 to 1939. Um, and I wanted to note also, as far as you mentioned Vietnam, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important point, especially as far as Mao is concerned. Mao became m militarily attacked Vietnam uh, you know, on more than one occasion and actually caused uh, a significant number of the deaths of the Vietnamese. Uh, because they were siding with the Soviet Union, because they weren't following Kao Kao to to, uh, to Peking, 
Um, so I, I just wanted to point that out. It seems like, um, you know, the fact that they had a North Vietnam, you know, why was there a North Vietnam? Well, Stalin brokered a deal with the imperialists to, do, to carve up the world in a very bureaucratic fashion. Obviously, you, you know, we're, we're supporting the overthrowing of property relations in, in Eastern Europe, but workers were already mobilizing there, you know. Uh, the independent initiative of workers was, was stopped as a means of maintaining total control over the movement. Uh, and they stopped it in other countries where it was going, uh, like in Greece, for example, um, around the same period, right after the war. Um, and, uh, you know, there should never have been a North Vietnam. The Vietnamese and the, and the Koreans had the whole peninsula. They had both, you know. They already had it. They won it after World War II. They won it during World War II. And the Stalinists handed half of it back. Um, and in, in my view, this is, while it's true that they did eventually win, although generally against different Stalinists at different times, uh, it was against them. You know, it, wasn't, it was not something that was supported. It was supported half-heartedly if it was at all. And uh, it, it was, a, you know, this, these, and this is precisely what I mean by the bureaucrats can't lead to socialism. And that's why we oppose them, not because we're about uber, you know, eighth dimension democracy. Um, but precisely because they can't do that. They have specific class interests that are different from working people. Um, so at any rate, that's, that's my view on it. There's a, there's a, a whole, the whole host of, you know, 1968 in Europe. I know there's a lot of differences of opinion about whether that was still Stalinist. Uh, in our view, uh, Stalinism, I guess I should clarify this point. Uh, just like I was saying before, Stalin it was a personality, you know. Uh, people could argue that Hitler and, and Mussolini were, you know, different in many ways. Um, but the, the same fundamental characteristics exist in both, you know. Excuse me. Um, the same fundamental characteristics ex exist in both, and we feel the same way about Khrushchev and Stalin, that both of them represented, uh, you know, the, the bureaucracy of the Soviet Union at different times, different points. And uh, so, our view of Stalinism is not about the individual. Obviously, Khrushchev spoke out against Stalin. So did Tito. Tito and Stalin were, Tito was the leader of the Yugoslavian Revolution, uh, and Enver Hoxha had his own issues uh, in, in uh, Albania. Um, they had issues with Stalin as well. Yeah, they, they all had issues with Stalin. Uh, the guy in North Korea, uh, Kim, Kim Il sung, right? Uh, I mean, he had issues with all of them. And he had his own little, I don't know how you pronounce it, UK theory or Uche or something. Uh, but, you know, they all had issues with each other. But the reality was, in our opinion, there's really no fundamental difference. The way that they function is the same way as proletarian Bonapartists. Uh, much the same way as fascists exist on top of capitalists, you know, as, a, as an irritation, you know, even a murderous one, that they have to put up with, you know, because there's nothing that, there's a vacuum of leadership and there's no way to replace it at the moment. Well, does anybody have any other further questions they'd like to address? Um, oh, that was okay. almost 10. Close to 10. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I sit down so I'm not. Uh, yeah, I mean, if we want to continue the discussion, yeah, <laughs> I, I'd like to change the battery as well if we're going to do that. I, I mean, does anybody want to continue with the discussion? Yes. Whatever, it's better. We, sh we should probably call it Dan and Hour afterwards. <laughs> All right, well, let's give our speaker a hand. Thank you for coming out.